Good morning. Thank you, Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon, for inviting me today. I'm truly honored to be here with you at Flowcon 2021. It's not easy to organize a virtual conference, especially during a time of pandemic. So I really appreciate all of your hard work to make this happen. As you know, this is a pre-recorded video and it's not easy to speak to a screen, but I will try. Hope you'll overlook my occasional fumbles and my deep Asian accent. The theme of this year's conference is using data to defend. Now defense, in our case, cyber defense, comprises of not just technology, but also professionals who develop and deploy them. So today I'll talk to you about some examples of how I have been using data throughout my academic career for technological innovation and upkeep in cyber, but most importantly, for recruiting, advancing, and retaining cyber professionals who use data to defend. Here is some data that directly relates to me. I was born and brought up in the fifth largest city in the world, Dhaka, in Bangladesh. I studied applied physics and electronics in the largest university in Dhaka, in Bangladesh. After graduation, I spent two years in software industry because at that time there was no opportunity for doctoral studies in computer science. I came to United States to pursue that dream. When I started as a graduate student, my son was two year old. When I started my academic career as a tenure track faculty, my daughter was two weeks old. So as I grew up as a faculty, they also did. I'm still working on it and so are they. So my university, Tennessee Tech University is in Middle Tennessee and it's mostly renowned for its reputation in engineering education. Now over the past years, it has also earned the reputation of being the place to be in cyber in Tennessee. If you haven't been to Tennessee, you should come. It's full of mountains, lakes, waterfalls, caves, one of the most beautiful states that I have been to, and I'm blessed to call it my home. Now, as some of you know, academia offers a lot of intellectual freedom and work flexibility. Good news is there is no supreme leader and bad news is there is no supreme leader. You're kind of your own boss, of course, under some restrictions and guidelines. So here I was at the beginning of my journey as a faculty and was thinking, where do I start? Which path do I take? There are so many choices and options and paths. So I started by listening to data. I knew that I did not want to become a faculty who is only doing teaching or research or service. I wanted to do some of all in some ways. I did not want to be an expert in one thing, but someone who ventured or tried different things. Now, I strongly believe education, research and outreach are very much interrelated, at least to me. I cannot be an effective leader in cyber if I'm not knowledgeable about what's current or cutting edge in the field. I can't be a great researcher without reaching out to and training students to engage with me. I can't be good at community engagement if I don't know enough about them and their needs. So today I'll talk about how I have been doing some data inspired initiatives in education, research, and outreach. The first one I'm going to talk about is some education initiatives. So as I started working at the, as a faculty, 
uh, in 2006, the growth in cybersecurity jobs were 19%, and security was one of the five priorities of federal government. However, at Tennessee Tech, there was no cybersecurity program in place. So I started by creating courses and then moved on to creating curriculum and then program. And I'm proud to let you know that in um, once in 2015, we started cybersecurity concentration. Over five and four years, it has quadrupled and cybersecurity concentration has majority of the students in computer science. Now, around that time, um, I also saw a report from Computer Crime and Security Survey that 60% of financial losses were attributed to non-malicious actions by insiders. So these were developers, these were designers, these were people who were actually using the systems. So 10 man hours of software development could be taken down by two weeks of ethical hacking on this. Problem was and still is, majority of US institutions don't require cybersecurity in their CS curriculum. So a lot of CS students who join the digital workforce, they are not security conscious. And it's extremely crucial that all CS students have some level of security consciousness because they are the designers, they are the developers, they are the one who implement code, deploy code and maintain systems. So with National Science Foundation funding, um, we established the Security Knitting Kit project. So the goal of this project was to improve security awareness, knowledge and interest of CS students and improve security awareness and teaching expertise for non-security faculty. That means faculty who don't teach security how to give them the skill set to bring security in their computer science classroom. So we chose four courses, software engineering, operating system, database and networks. All these courses are required computer science courses that every computer science student would see somewhere in their curriculum. And then we developed modules, uh, instructional modules for each of these categories associated with active learning exercises and it provided all of these to faculty so that when they're talking about database management system, they can spend one lecture in security issues in database or when they're talking about operating system, they can spend at least one lecture in security issues in operating system. They can have their students go through these exercises so that they learn about subject specific security issues. With a second NSF grant, um, we um, once we instit institutionalized security knitting kit at Tennessee Tech and provided training to 17 different security faculty from 13 colleges. We did a series of workshops, um, both multi-day workshops and mini workshops to 50 plus colleges and 80 plus colleges and provided them material that they can take to their institutions so that their computer science students who don't have dedicated security courses can still see security in their curriculum. Now, as we um, continued, we saw that the demand for cybersecurity professionals continued to increase. It was predicted that by 2019, 
it will rise globally to 6 million with a projected skill gap of 1.5 million. Plus, we had all these cybersecurity students and we wanted to find a way to facilitate or support their engagement in cybersecurity beyond classroom with information, informational education, research and outreach. As I was saying, we wanted to find a way to facilitate and support students' engagement in cybersecurity beyond classroom with informal education, research, and outreach opportunities. So in 2016, January, Cybersecurity Education Research and Outreach Center at Tennessee Tech was established. The mission of this center was to increase public awareness of cyber, train students for cybersecurity workforce pipeline, facilitate advanced research, promote and disseminate cybersecurity artifacts, and share expertise with community. Quick facts about CIROC. Um, we are NSA DHS designated center of academic excellence in cyber defense education, one of 337 in nation and one of four colleges in Tennessee. We are the first and largest cyber core SF scholarship for service program in state of Tennessee, one of 86 in the nation, and one of 10 with community college pathway into our cyber core program. We are also the only cybersecurity scholarship program by DOD in the state of Tennessee. So over the years, um, we had recruited 44 students in 4.5 years in both of these scholarships. 18 have graduated and some of them are already placed in these agencies. And we are very proud of them. As I was saying uh, at CROG, we try our best to engage students in informal education research and outreach initiatives so that they have an opportunity of an integrated learning experience. They are involved in clubs, competitions, offense, defense, city of interest groups, faculty guided research, various outreach events at CIROC. We provide them with choices and support them and they choose what they want to do how much they want to get involved. Now, as um, we had all these education research and outreach initiatives, we needed a virtual isolated contained infrastructure that will support them. We call these infrastructure nowadays as cyber range. Problem is ready-made cyber range cost is very significant. They can start anywhere from half a million to multi-million dollars. Problem is not all institutions have big donors or have access to such funds. Therefore, we decided to build our own cyber range. So with some support from NSF and DOD, we developed a cyber range from scratch that has a controlled network air-gapped environment, allows automated configuration with Solste, rapid project deployment using Terraform-based solutions. It is flexible and adaptable where we can change the environments at will with just a few lines of code. It's scalable because we can just add hardware nodes that allows us to immediately scale up. And the cost of this, it's quite low, around $150,000 as of now. Being an in-house solutions essentially cut down our cost. 
So the range right now supports many of our education initiatives like the different classes and labs. It supports the interest group trainings, competitions. We have several faculty that are using CyberRange for their research. And we also use the CyberRange for conducting um, different outreach activities. Like this summer, we use the CyberRange for doing virtual cyber camps. We use it for faculty workshops. The picture that you see is of a STEM mobile that we take to underprivileged schools. And then um, students go through the big bus and uh, connect with the cyber range at tech and conduct different cybersecurity exercises to learn about cybersecurity. Next, I'm going to talk about some research work done by my student team. The first one is about network covert channel detection. So network covert channel is a hidden or unintended form of communication using existing network protocol. They are used for leaking sensitive information or communicating unauthorized information such as used in botnets. The majority of work done in covert channel detection has been for specific network protocols such as IP in network layer or TCP in transport layer and so on. So detection mechanisms that work for one may not work for the other. Also, there is lack of open source data to perform robust analysis using multiple protocols. So we generated network traffic data set with storage covert channels that were created by manipulating attributes for IPv4 at network layer, for TCP at transport layer, and DNS at the application layer. This data set is publicly available for those who are interested. Our bigger goal was to run the data set consisting of both non-covert and covert traffic through a protocol independent framework with machine learning to distinguish between the two kinds. We applied some data processing and feature engineering techniques to process data generically, then used few supervised learning techniques such as support vector machines, logical regression, k-nearest neighbor decision trees to classify between benign and covert communication logs. We found that support vector machine with Gaussian kernel was the most effective technique for covert channel detection for both network and transport layers, and decision tree classifier was best for application layer. Student credits for this work goes to Stephen Smith and Asan Ayub. They can be reached at this email address for any additional questions regarding this. The next work I'm going to talk about is about Darknet. So while anonymity tools help, such as the Torn network, with protecting privacy of online users, they do get abused with malicious intent. One example is the dark web which houses anything from illegal drugs to pawns to malware. 57% of these sites in the dark web host illicit material. And it has been reported that harmful dark web listings increased 20% over the last few years. So anonymity tools make it difficult to investigate these criminals in the dark web, especially when crime investigations are done manually. So we wanted to apply some automation to enhance the investigation process that can lead to more effective analysis of dark marketplaces. 
So we applied machine learning and automation techniques to support dark web investigators with vendor attribution. So we basically scrape the dark web marketplaces to parse products and data, translated them to features to apply machine learning models so that models can build profiles of users. We ran our experiments on dark marketplace archive of approximately 1500 gigabytes of data. As we analyzed the vendors, we looked at how they write, what products they sell, the images that they use without the need for downloading the images, and how they identified themselves to buyers using aliases. Basically, we profiled vendors based on their publicly available data. As the profiling tool, we used Random Forest Classifier, which is good in handling mixed data types, missing and or irrelevant or redundant data. We found that vendors can be identified by looking at their product listing as long as they have more than 25 listings and a combination of stylometric, attribute, and image-based um, features helped in identifying them. And random forest classifiers that we used um, performed very robustly. So the student credit for this work goes to Suzanne Zezerowski. The next work that we are going to look at is about DGAs. So we all know that botnets are a big menace and there can be millions and millions of exploited computers in a botnet. Most of these machines are compromised by users visiting malicious domains that are created by these domain generation algorithms or DGAs. So with millions of sites created by DGS, blacklist defense mechanisms don't perform well anymore. So machine learning can be effective, but they also don't perform well with never before seen DGA families when we use unrepresentative training data set. So to address the problem of unrepresentative training dataset, we used a novel approach to generate a rich set of training data representing malicious domain name using a data augmentation technique in an adversarial way. This allows the machine learning model to better detect never before seen DGA families which in turn can improve dynamic blacklisting of malicious sites. So using a data perturbation technique with GAN, calculated noise is added to the DGA-based malicious domain in creating more of such samples. And then the augmented data set with these represented samples are used to retrain the classifier. Adding these representative data increased the model's generalization ability in learning patterns. As the classifier, we used LSTM or long short-term memory, which is a type of recurrent neural network. We found that the GAN produced malicious samples were able to fool the LSTM models initially, but once the model was trained with the representative, more balanced adversarial data, detection rate improved significantly. Student credit for this work goes to Ilmaz Ibrahim. The next one we are going to look at is about ransomware protection. So last few years, ransomware has become a huge problem, especially with government agencies, healthcare, school districts. Global ransomware cost is predicted to be 20 billion by 2021. An average ransom payment is almost $1.4 million, and this process can large, last on average 14 days. 
So it's very important that we catch ransomware activity very early and intervene. So we did some time series analysis on 383 ransomware samples belonging to 21 ransomware families to learn their behavior. We observed that through IRP logs, which are IO request packets that are used to communicate IO requests between user applications and OS, that the ransomware performed the majority of operations in the first 40 minutes. So our findings include identification of five very unique file IO sequences of actions during the ransomware infection. And we also found that ransomware access more number of files than benign applications, while benign applications perform more modifications on file compared to ransomware. Student credit for this work goes to Asan Ayu. Our ongoing work involves building a data-driven knowledge base of ransomware behavior over time, and we are working on building machine learning-based defensive tool for early detection. The last research work that I'm going to talk about is about privacy preserving smart meter usage. So utilities around the world has been investing um, more than 30 billion over the next five years. By middle of next decade, there is predicted that there will be 1.3 billion smart meters in place, which will of course allow better monitoring and control of consumers' load profile. It will allow more precise computing of user billings and dynamic pricing and future load need. So it has been reported um, that looking at energy usage of consumers, because there is a strong correlation between users' occupancy and their energy consumption, occupancy attacks can be conducted where user activity can be identified based on their energy usage. So when they were home, what type of appliances they use, how much energy they use at different periods of the day. Now all this information can be used for malicious intent such as undesired unsolicited advertising, surveillance, even burglary. So we proposed a model called Adversarial Machine Learning Occupancy Detection Avoidance or MLODA model. So in this model, we want to hide the time of energy usage information in such a way that it preserves privacy of the user without using any trusted third party or additional hardware so that it can be deployed easily without using cryptographic techniques so that it's not computationally complex. So first we observe the characteristic behavior of energy usage of users from historical data. And then their consumption patterns are modified by adding noise to their energy usage data that is carefully calculated based on the observation. With added noise, electricity suppliers will not be able to learn any true nature of energy consumption except what they need to know, which is the total energy usage for the customers. So we found that um, we were able to conduct successful occupancy detection attacks ourselves with novel application of LSTM machine learning model 
as compared with support vector machine and k nearest neighbor. And as we did privacy preservation with different extents of masking occupancy, that increasing the extent of masking or penetration coefficient does make the energy consumption data as represented by the orange lines in these pictures more and more noticeable than the actual consumption of at the granular level represented by the blue line. But it still allows utility companies to see the total energy usage allowing correct billing. However, for real-time optimization needed in demand response calculation, smaller penetration coefficient is better. So there is a trade-off between efficiency and privacy. Some users may deem privacy more important than energy efficiency and vice versa. And we found that the accuracy of the machine learning LSTM model used in occupancy attack degraded with the masking. So the more we increased the noise or the penetration coefficient, the accuracy of the LSTM model decre decreased, preserving privacy of the user. So the student credit of this work goes to Ilmaz Ibrahim. Any questions related to all the research work that we talked about, um, you can email siroc at tntech.edu and we will try to um, address those. Next, I'm going to talk about some initiatives in outreach. So we know that less than 45% of K-12 students receive regular or cybersecurity or cyber awareness type of education. And most of them that they do receive are related to cyber safety. Now, according to Kaspersky, most students make up their mind about careers before their 16th birthday. So if we want to increase pipeline in cybersecurity, we have to reach to K-12 students. So NSA Gen Cyber Project was established because of that. So it is an NSA NSF initiative, and we have been participating in this initiative since 2016 by conducting summer cybersecurity camps for middle and high school students, teachers, and guidance counselors. So far, we have conducted camps for more than 250 rising high schoolers and 20 teachers and counselors. We are also working on another project called Cyber Encounters with in partnership with the SANS Corporation, where last year we reached 150 teachers across five states with 1,000 students, where we engaged them in SANS Cyber Start program, uh, conducted workshops, given them training, and followed up with competition. This year we are working with more than 300 junior ROTC cadets to get them engaged in SANS CyberStock program. Another thing that we noticed that most of the job posting requires bachelor's education, which is 78% of them, as compared to 21% looking for anything um, below bachelor's education. Now, community college students are very diverse. So 56% of community college students are women and 25% of them are underrepresented 
minorities. 29% of them are first generation college students. 5% are non-traditional students who come from military service or transitioning from other careers or coming back to work. So it was very obvious to us that we need to find some way to show and support community college students' path to higher education in cyber. So our <clears throat> the newest DOD C3 grant is about that. So it's a community college cyber enrichment program sponsored by NSA. And our goal is to increase the pipeline of cybersecurity students from community college students in Tennessee. Things that we have done already are outreach seminar, um, multi-day cybersecurity workshop for community college students. This summer, we'll be conducting a cyber breach program for community college students giving them opportunity to take college credit courses and be involved with CROC in its um, education research and outreach activities. We will also provide them sponsored opportunity to participate in other online cybersecurity competitions with training and attend cybersecurity conferences. Another project that we are working with um, NSA is the CDI project. So this is an initiative by NSA because uh, minorities represent 26% of cybersecurity professionals, while Black Americans represent 16.6% of them. But the biggest problem is minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities do not have adequate resources to build their cyber program. So we joined the CDI coalition as part of a team of 11 universities by NSA to grow the pipeline of cybersecurity workforce for underrepresented and minority students nationwide. So we will be providing student training, faculty training, we'll be hosting competitions for students from these institutions, we'll be providing mentoring for club and student organization and sponsored opportunity for minority serving students to for minority students to participate in competitions and conferences. The next initiative, uh, or the last initiative that I'm going to talk about, is about gender diversity. In 2012, it was reported that only 11% of cybersecurity workforce were women while the STEM workforce had 50% of them. It was very apparent because in most of my classes, I was the only female in the classroom. So I looked at gender balance challenges and there were many. Lack of awareness about this field, stereotypical notions that this is a male dominated field it's only for very technical persons, lack of resources and opportunities, lack of visibility of role models in the field, and lack of access to mentors and social support, mostly lack of a community. So reached out to National Science Foundation for a project involving broadening participation of women in cyber. And NSF provided us with an award to conduct a very small conference with 250 folks in two years. And the model was that, that this conference is going to have comparable students and non-students ratio it's going to be accessible to everyone, including students and faculty and professional. Content 
was going to be focused on education, research, outreach, and industry, and it will also house a career or graduate school fair. So with $70,000, we started for two years. But over the next couple of years, that initiative um, kept growing like a snowball. And it's because the support of a community. So the more people who came to the conference, they joined a community. They joined like-minded peers and they wanted to give back and they wanted to bring others like them. And with the help of this community, WISIS has become the largest cybersecurity conference in the USA that ensures comparable representation of students and professionals under one roof ensures academia and industry from both public and private sector under one roof. So in WISIS, women who are underrepresented in the industry are represented and celebrated. So in seven years, we were able to provide support and accommodate 6,400 attendees 3,000 student scholarship, 340 faculty grants, and 26 veterans awards, all because of $3.5 million industry support. As we became a community that continued to grow, we had to establish a nonprofit organization. So the nonprofit organization's mission is to build a gender diverse cybersecurity workforce by facilitating recruitment, retention, and advancement of women in the field. So the two year old organization now consists of more than 6,000 members where you can see half of them are students, the other half consists of industry professionals and faculty and veterans and others. We do have a board of directors. Um, in fact, Dr. Greg Shannon from CMU is, one of in, is a member of our board since we started. I forgot to mention that Carnegie Mellon has been our co-host in 2019 to organize the conference in Pittsburgh. We had great support from friends like Michelle Tomasek, Dina Samitis, Bobby Stimpley, and Laurie Krenner. So there are many initiatives that has been taken on by the organization. That's all about empowering this this community of women in cybersecurity. It includes our annual flagship conference and uh, webinars, um, different training opportunities, community forum. In two or three years, we have 114 student chapters, not just in the USA, but at other parts of the world. Carnegie Mellon also has a student chapter here, and we are very happy to have that. There are 32 WISIS professional affiliates globally, and this is the map that shows the different affiliates, not just in North America, but different parts of the world. In addition to the annual conference, we also have an annual virtual career fair. The last one we had in 2020 was heavily attended with 84 organizations participating in the career fair. We organize a webinar series that has around 9,000 subscribers. We do webinars that uh, provide content from our 
uh, members of the community and strategic partners on different technical topics. Uh, usually we have two webinars a month. We have a newsletter that has more than 6,000 subscribers. We have News Bytes that is exclusively for our members. This summer, because of COVID, we launched three different training programs, one with um, SANS Corporation that was sponsored by Google, one with AWS, um, about AWS JAMX series and one for National Cyber League competition participation sponsored by Target. We just launched a mentor mentee program. In the first program, we have around 187 mentors and around 700 mentees. Um, so far, it's going very well with a structured framework. All of this that we do at WISIS is because of our partnership with this um, industry and government and academic partnerships. As you can see, um, without these organizations being engaged with us year long, we won't be able to do, do what we do. Also, um, we are very thankful that for each year we get so many sponsors because without them we won't be able to support half of the attendees of the conference who are students and who receive scholarships for their lodging meals and a lot of them receive scholarships for travel as well. This year we also started um, veteran assistance program. So this is a program to assist the female veterans in our community to transition into cybersecurity. In phase one, we provided fellowship awards for them to attend the conference at no cost. In phase two, in addition to that, we are launching, we just launched a veteran apprenticeship program where we are working with our industry partners to provide them with apprenticeship, and job placement opportunities along with training opportunities. Again, everything we do is possible because of our strategic partners and conference sponsors. So what keeps us inspiring is that now uh, gender diversity in 2020 has increased to 20 to 24% as opposed to 11% when we started. I'm sure we are not the only one contributing to this. There are other organizations in this space that are also contributing, but we are, uh, we are one of them. And we are going to keep working at it until the cybersecurity workforce is gender balanced. I also wanted to tell you about WISIS 2021 that we had to move from March to next September. So scholarship applications are open for students and faculty, for veterans and for BPOC community and call for participation is open. I also wanted to stress that WISIS is a very inclusive community. We, it's not just a conference of women in cybersecurity, it's a conference for um, like-minded people who support diversity and inclusion. So I also wanted to mention that um, CROC, um, my, my job, uh, we keep going because over the last few years, we have reached over 7,000 young men and women across Tennessee and beyond Tennessee to spread the word about cyber through camps, through school visits, through field trips, STEM mobile trips, workshops. And this number does not even include um, the impact that, that started from um, CROC with WISIS. I wanted to show you some of our young men and women because um, they are inspirationals. 
they are the ones that are in the middle of everything that makes us look good, makes me look good. At last, I wanted to thank you for inviting me here today to talk to you. Um, if you are looking for a message in this talk, I guess the message will be look around you, see who and why you are serving, where is the need or gaps, how can you contribute. Let data guide you in your own doings and to make a difference. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for that uh, talk, Dr. Siraj. It's a pleasure to be here with you. We've had some, some good questions coming in in the Zoom chat and Discord. And so we'll see which of those we can get through here. Um, I'll go ahead and dive right in. Uh, the first question, you talked about involving students in education, research, and outreach. So typically in most universities, students are obviously involved in the education process. Um, and we see good faculty mentors engaging their students in research. Um, why is it that also getting your students involved in the outreach, do you find that to be so important? Thank you, Josh, and thank you to everyone for, you know, listening to the talk. I know it's not easy to listen to recordings, and but thank you for your patience and thank you for joining us. So to answer your question, Josh, um, a um, couple of reasons I can um, think of. One is, you know, computer science students, and I hate to say that me being a computer science student too, but computer science students um, don't have great reputation in communication skills. Um, of course, there are a lot of exceptions. Um, but I think this exercise of putting students in front of audience improves their communication skill a lot. Um, second, you know, service learning is, has research showed that service learning is one of the most effective way to learn, learning while doing something, especially learning while teaching. You know, if, if we as educators, you know, the more, I feel like the more I teach, I get better at something. So that's another reason. And Third reason, which is very important to me, is making students understand the importance of paying it forward. Um, when they are out there in communi doing community work, you know, going to schools, um, uh, going to conferences, and presenting their work or teaching kids in camps, you know, they see and understand the importance of uh, paying it forward, they see how the um, K-12 kids or the community college students get inspired by seeing um, students like them or, you know, someone that they can think of as role models, mentors. So that, in fact, you know, from my experience, I have seen that actually lifts them up. The students feel more inspired to continue with their work and they feel more motivated. So I think this experience of outreach is not just uh, beneficial to the audience where they do it, whom they do it for, but also for themselves as well. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, to, to that end, uh, there's a follow-up sort of question here. Uh, you showed some, some metrics there, right, where about half of the STEM pipeline is is women, and yet in cybersecurity, there's only a, about a 20 to 24 percent representation mm -hmm. population. So the question is for for both women and men participating in Flowcon, you know those those that are here with us, whether in academia, government, or industry, uh, what would you say is the is the one single most important thing that each of us can do as an individual? To, to work on addressing that gender imbalance problem that exists specifically in cyber? I think the biggest thing that we can all do is change our mindset. And, you know, as women, I think 
the more we see ourselves at as cybersecurity professionals who happen to be women as opposed to women in cybersecurity then it's it's more um it's better for us to feel equal behave uh, you know um and you know when you feel yourself to be equal to everything to your counterparts then it becomes much easier and you you have more confidence and i think for the men also you know i think the only thing is give women um uh, space i mean see them as equal even if you don't do anything special for them you don't have to but give them uh the equal access to responsibilities resources rewards even reprimands so i think once we all have that mindset of equality i think you know a lot of the problems would be um would go away thanks thanks for, very much for that thoughtful answer um i just want to before we continue on note that i'm going to share some of these questions in the discord text channel Uh, since I don't know that we're going to have time to have a good conversation about all of them, I want to make sure that uh, that we get a chance to continue and, and sort of complete the conversation as we move into the breakout room after this. Uh, so that said, uh, we did have a question come in from mm-hmm. Discord, and uh, you, know, you told me directly an answer, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to to unpack a little bit. So you got an NSF grant for the security knitting kit project. Um, mm-hmm. and you you said that all the PIs on that were faculty and you've done a lot of work in sort of preparing students to go out into government and and industry right Tennessee Tech is an SFS school and so forth um have you had other grants or you have some in the pipeline where you've got a uh, government or industry professionals co-writing those grants um the ones that um i'm working on right now you know it's all on un- for i mean for some reason now that you mentioned it i mean none of them include industry partners for now um doesn't say that we won't do it in future but for now it doesn't so people i involved with writing grants so far has been academia um most okay i say yeah and there's there's a big need certainly for uh preparing professionals with a much more robust set of skills as you've as you've spoken to. Um so I'm going to move to the next question Tim asked in Zoom for the ransomware research. Mm-hmm. Did you specifically contrast ransomware activity against live network uh, backup activity? Um no, not yet, but that's one of um this is a ongoing work that uh, one of my PhD student Asan Ayub, you know, he has been working on this for I would say one year plus um so it's in preliminary stage so we haven't done that yet right now all the data we are working on are you know from published malware research data Okay thanks I will also comment that um I saw Asan had been speaking a little bit to this in the Discord channel as well mm-hmm. um so there's there's some conversation about that Great. about that over there Um so uh another question in terms of broader outreach mm. uh coming in from the Zoom chat does Wesis do uh high school outreach you talked about the summer camps and things but what about Wesis So Wesis don't have a specific program for uh K12 outreach now right now you know Wesis focuses on college level students and cybersecurity professionals in general having said that doesn't mean we'll not have a program like that in future um i do want to mention a couple of programs that does work in that space one is cyber and i'm going to put up that link in discord so it's work from dakota state university and then there is a group of student that started um a program called k12 um cybersecurity podcast or something like that but i'm going to put that up as well um but i know i i think audience already knows the biggest work in k12 space in cybersecurity is obviously nss gen cyber program and i think they have camps in 
in almost every state now. I'll put up that link also in Discord. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, so one question that uh, has occurred to me sort of now as we've been talking, you, you talk about having your students in scholarship or service place in places like some of the national labs and service research labs. Uh, you and I spoke some time ago about how you don't just incorporate textbook exercises, mm -hmm. but use more practical examples in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious to know what sort of experience those alumni of your program, particularly in Surak, as they've gone out into these research positions, I'm curious to know what their experience has been as new professionals compared with, with their other colleagues with the, the more intentionality that you've placed into the training program. Have they, have they reported back that that's been uh, a foundation they found themselves set apart with? So the thing is the, 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 our students who go and work for government, you know, usually they work in secret projects and they can't talk about their work particularly, but I, you know, from them and also from students that are working in industry, um, you know, often we hear from them that, you know, the fact that uh, through CROC, they have been engaged with the community, uh, whether through service learning projects, like for example, uh, what we do every year is our team of students go to small businesses or utility companies or small manufacturing companies, and they would provide free cybersecurity assessment for their IT infrastructure. So they would look at, you know, uh, what weaknesses they have as they perceive, and then they will provide recommendations and uh, for a to have a improved cybersecurity posture. I think that exercise particularly has been very helpful for them. And I've also heard from students um, in our IT security class, while the class goes on and teaches students about um, building a IT infrastructure from scratch and securing it, while there is another class, ethical hacking, that uh, after each exercise, they come and kind of stress test the environment, tries to hack and tries to find flaws with that environment and reports back to them. And then they would in turn fix it and try to make it better. So I think this interactions between the two classes, um, I have been told that, you know, our alums found that very useful as well. Wonderful. Thanks so much for your responses and thank you for joining us.